and back again to the photo. That's you, the policeman explained. And it says there's an outstanding warrant for your arrest. See, my experience is not uncommon. As it turned out, the outraged homeowner who had stomped into the police station demanding justice ended up unwittingly identifying himself as a wanted criminal. All over the world, we find people in my situation under the law with warrants for their arrest. In a very real sense, it seems like crime and violence are everywhere, even where you do not expect to find it. It is in the workplace, in schools, in shopping malls, and even in churches with pastors like me. <laughs> and it's not just organized crime. More and more we read about lone individuals, young or old, often without a criminal record, going on violent shooting sprees in America, killing multiple victims, engaging in mass murder. Why is there such crime on the rise? What's behind the lawlessness and the violence? What has happened to our world? I'm so glad you asked the question. In the Western world, and even more affluent countries of the world, there's a new generation of youth that have emerged who are questioning and skeptical and challenging of the existing system. And who are their role models? Well, many times they are drawn to the entertainers and the athletes who are living just for the moment. Too often, too often they watch their own parents lie or steal when it's convenient. They watch their role models. Their role models engage in trickery and criminal behavior just to get ahead. They watch folks in their society cheat on their taxes, violate the morals of society when they could get away with it. Even some churches today are teaching that God's standard of right and wrong no longer applies. They teach that his commandments are completely abolished. Now I just stopped by to tell somebody that if you belong to a church that teaches this, then here's what lives behind such a conversation. It is a declaration that you can live the best life without obeying God, without any obedience to God because God's commandments are designed to give you access to the very best life. Now let me just break it down and make it plain. God's commandments, the first four talk about love for God. The last six talk about love for your fellow man. And I prescribe to you this evening that if you want to have the very best life, if you want to have a life filled with joy, if you want a life of destiny, if you want a life of accomplishment, if you want a life of success, if you want a life of effectiveness and impact in society where you're recognized and where you're honored and where you're respected, and where you live the best life, it serves you well to follow God's commandments. Amen, somebody. It serves you well to follow God's commandments. If you follow God's commandments, you will get to live the very best life. I'm gonna break that down for you and make it plain so that you can understand when folks tell you that the commandments are done away with, they are abolished. Let's talk about it. There are folks who believe that his commandments are no longer relevant or that they are impossible to keep. And I like what scripture says here because without moral guidance, there are many people that are just doing their own thing and society is reaping a harvest of broken homes, of uncontrolled children and violent crimes. In the words of the prophet Hosea, they sow the wind and they will weep, reap the whirlwind. But the question must be answered. Tonight, who determines when a situation is right or wrong? Now, let me make this very clear to you tonight. If there's no commandments, if the commandments are done away with, we know who did away with the commandments. 
we know that the one who claims that the commandments are done away with, they're just trying to do away with what, everybody? They're trying to do away with God's authority. Remember, I've been telling you every night this week that there are two systems. How many systems? Two systems. How many systems? Two systems. The first system is built on the system of God, God's system. The text here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. I told you already that strength here really means power. And the word power here really means authority. And the counterfeit system established by our enemy reverses that. The dragon, verse 13, chapter 13, verse 2, the dragon gave him his power. That's energy, life, his throne, that's kingdom, and great authority. And so what we've got going on in the world, let me break it down and make it plain, is we've got a counterfeit authority, a evil demonic authority that is saying that God's authority is done away with. That God no longer has authority expressed, manifested, and articulated by the Ten Commandments. That authority has been done away with. Because what he's trying to do is ultimately say, God is done away with. God's authority is done away with. Next, God's kingdom is done away with. And then finally, God is done away with. Worship me instead. And that's why we have a world in ruin. We have a world that's wrecked. We have a world that's broken and battered and beaten and bruised because we have men and women all around the world who've chosen because of the deception going on, because of the lies being told. They've chosen to live their life believing that they don't have to obey God's commandments, that God no longer has a standard of righteousness in the world. And this teaching has led to a society that's experiencing moral decay and society, societal brokenness and decadence and a life lived beneath your purpose, apart from your promise and devoid of divine providence. And so you walk around your world, your community, your society, and you see folks who are depressed, dejected, downtrodden, messed up. Why? Because they're not living up to their full potential. And I'm going to show you here this evening how the Ten Commandments give you access to the very best life. They give you access to a life with destiny, a life of power, a life of victory, a life of joy, a life of happiness, a life of tremendous accomplishments. And if you want to have that life, you've got to surrender and submit yourself to God's will, God's word, and God's way. The Bible says there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. See, the Bible reminds us that we are not good judges of what is right and what is wrong. God and God alone is the judge of what is right and what is wrong. The fact is that our natural human hearts often really don't want to know the truth about right and wrong. The apostle Paul predicted this when he said these words, for the time will come in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. If you give me a little bit more power on this mic, I won't have to preach so hard tonight. If you just turn it up a wee bit, then I'll lower my voice. Thank you so much. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, teachers, pastors, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Yet, sad to say, we are discovering that we do not get freedom by throwing out the rules. It should be no surprise then to anybody that if you remove the standard of right and wrong, chaos results. If you removed all the traffic signs and the signals, there would be absolute chaos on the roadways and on the highways. There's no true freedom 
When you get rid of the rules, we don't prosper, we don't rise, we're not elevated, we're not sanctified, we're not more holy, we're not more blessed. We don't prosper when we forget the foundation of a prosperous society. When the children of Israel encamped at Mount Sinai, right up there in the North African Peninsula, that's where it was. They'll try and tell you it's the Middle East, but it's the North African Peninsula. Amen, somebody. Amen. I got a one amen over there. I got to help y'all. Mount Sinai, where the law was given, was in Africa. It's in the North African Peninsula. Amen, somebody. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I got an amen again. The Lord came down to meet them and said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. First, the Lord identified himself as their deliverer from slavery. He was the one who had opened up the Red Sea before them. He was their protector. He was their savior. He was their deliverer. In other words, he says, I care for you. I care about you and you can trust me. Then he gave them 10 laws to live by that would give them a sense of destiny, purpose, and love. Now, I told you a few nights ago that whenever God gives an imperative, he always gives an imperative that simply means a command. When God commands you to do something, when he gives you an imperative, he always gives an imperative against an indicative. The imperative always follows the indicative of who God is. The indicative is a part of speech that just declares who he is. It's a statement about a facts about who God is. And wherever you read in the Bible, I heard somebody today, they told me, I read the Bible. Well, if you read the Bible, you're seeing imperatives and indicatives. And whenever you see an imperative in the Bible, I encourage you, I invite you, and I challenge you, go look for the indicative. And when you find the indicative, that means whenever you see a command, when God commands you to do something in Holy Scripture, go look for the statement of facts about who God is. And when you catch a glimpse of who God is, you'll always see that he's a God of love. He's a God of goodness. He's a God of grace. He's a God of peace. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of kindness. And he is your God. And so every command from God is against the backdrop of who God is what he's done, what he's accomplished, and what he's up to in the world. There is no command from God that does not have a statement of facts about who God is. And God here is saying, hey, I delivered you. I brought you out of the land of bondage and Egyptian slavery. I set you free. I, I made a, pla a plain, pa a clear path for you in the wilderness. I fed you with water, uh, with manna, and gave you water in the desert. And now, therefore, here are my 10 commands that will keep you secure in our relationship and give you access to the very best life. Now, let me make something clear to you. If there are no Ten Commandments, if the Ten Commandments are done away with, then that means you can do whatever you want. And if it's true that you could do whatever you want, then you devolve into basic animals who operate by the law of the jungle. Now, let me explain how the law of the jungle works for a moment. Now, I'm not from Africa. I'm from America. And we don't, well, they do have jungles over there. But they don't call them jungles. They just call them wildlife sanctuaries. But when it comes to Africa, they say African jungles. I want to reverse that a little bit tonight. Is that okay? Tonight, we have in Africa some wildlife sanctuaries. And the law of the wildlife sanctuary goes like this. It's okay for the weak, pardon me, it's okay for the strong to eat the weak. Isn't that the way it works? Everywhere in the jungle, I mean the wildlife sanctuary, Everywhere I look in the wildlife sanctuaries of Africa, I see the strong eating the weak. Is that what you see? You've been here a lot longer than I have. I see the lions eating the gazelles. The strong eat the weak. That's the law of the jungle. And if there is no law among human beings, 
then it's okay for the strong to eat the weak. Strong countries could devour weak countries. Strong people could destroy and demolish and kill weak people. Strong folks, strong men could rape, pillage, murder, that you could do whatever you want. If there is no law, then we devolve into a society made up of animals who operate according to the law of the jungle, the wildlife sanctuary. And so the mere fact that every society on the planet where there is humanity that has formulated itself into an organized community establishes and articulates that no, it's wrong for the strong to eat the weak within the human tribe of animals. There must be a law that functions and operates outside the realm of humanity, above human life and above animal life that says it's wrong for the strong to eat the weak. Have you got it now? Have you got it now? Yes, there's a law that operates above the law of the animal kingdom that says if you want to have the very best life as a human being and live in human community and society, it's not okay for the strong to eat the weak. That's the law that our arch enemy is saying has been done away with. Let's look at that real quick. Now, the first four commandments talk about love for God. The last six talk about love for your fellow man. These 10 laws focus your attention away from yourself and direct your attention to God and to others. Look, 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 look. Let's take a real quick look at these laws. He gave them this divine law so that they could know how to live in peace and safety to, so that man could know the difference between right and wrong. Let's look at these laws real quick. Let's take a quick look at the list of the Ten Commandments, which he spoke from Mount Sinai in the North African Peninsula. You shall have no other gods before me. This law sustains and maintains your connection to the true and living God. Yes, it does. And then the second commandment says, you shall not make unto you any carved image. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. This law maintains your relationship to God in your mind. So you have no image of a false God that you're now making into the true God or trying to operate and relate to it like it is the true God. It protects you from worshiping an entity that looks like God, but is not God. Then this law here, the third one says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, this law protects your mouth so that you do not speak disrespectfully about God or use his name carelessly. Because human beings have the capacity, like God, to speak things into existence. God is a God who creates by speaking. He spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. We have that power as well as human beings. That's why I tell people everywhere, no matter where I go, that if you learn how to speak your word with power in the world and then bring powerful action to stand behind your word, you can make things happen. You can transform your society. You can change your community. You don't have to tell the sad story of what happened years ago. You can acknowledge what happened years ago. You don't have to forget your history, but you've got power because of the power that now comes from God, the spiritual power that comes because of his great salvation and the authority that comes from Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and the kingdom of God he has now established in your community. You have power to speak your word in the world. And whatever you speak becomes a reality. If you don't like your life where you are right now, you can declare a different life. You can articulate a brand new future for yourself. You can speak a different word then bring powerful, consistent, dedicated action to stand behind your word and like God, because you were created in his image. Like God, you can bring things into existence. You can change Balawayo. You can change Zimbabwe. You can change Africa. If you, as a collective community, commit and dedicate yourselves to speaking your word, in the world, declaring what you want, how you want your society to look, how you want the community to function, how you want to operate. You can speak your word, bring powerful action to stand behind your word, and your word will become law in the universe. That's the power that God has put in your tongue. And that's why God said, don't take my name in vain. 
Because if you violate his name, then you'll cause his name to be of no value and no power to you. You'll no longer be able to call on his name and experience the impact of the name of Jesus. Don't take his name in vain. Don't use his name carelessly. Then the fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. This law protects your time with God. And it protects your relationship with God as creator and redeemer of your life. And it's amazing that the devil has played with this law more than all. Because he don't want you to have no more time with God. He doesn't want God to have time with you. Neither does he want you to have a relationship with God as creator. He doesn't want you to acknowledge the relationship God sought to establish by declaring he is the creator. And he does not want you to establish God as your redeemer. He wants you to run your life ragged, stress yourself out, frustrate your entire humanity trying to create what only God could create. And try to redeem what only God could redeem. And we do that as human beings when we forget, forsake, and ignore the awesome truth and amazing reality that he is the creator and he is the redeemer. He's never asked you to make a leaf grow. He's never called upon you to make a blossom, a, a, a flower bloom. God is the creator. God says, if you plant the seed, I'll make it grow. God makes things grow. God makes the seeds grow. God makes the flowers bloom. He is the creator. Now, if God were to reverse that and say, no, 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 uh, I'll plant the seed and you make it grow, you'd be up all night trying to figure that out, won't you? Aren't you glad God says, if you plant the seed, I'll make it grow? See, you got to give God the hard part. Amen, somebody. Always give God the hard part. Give God the hard part. Lord, I'll plant the seed. Some of you farmers know what I'm talking about. I plant the seed, Lord, you make it grow. And then God makes it grow because he's the creator. But he's also the redeemer. And this commandment is the only commandment that articulates that he is the creator of heaven and of earth. And the devil plays with this commandment because he doesn't want you to acknowledge God as creator of heaven and earth. Because if you did that, then you will acknowledge that God is the owner and the rightful power in the universe that can articulate how you should live your life because as owner, he has authority. Then there's this other commandment that says, honor your father and your mother. This law protects your relationship with your mother and your father. And I just want to say something about this law and the fourth commandment law. These two laws, the fourth commandment law and the fifth commandment law are the only positive laws in the 10 commandment decalogue. All the other laws talk about don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, you shall not do that. But this law, the fourth commandment law and the fifth commandment law are the only positive laws. Do remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Do honor your father and your mother. And I wondered why. Why are these the only two positive laws? The Holy Spirit told me because these are the two laws that articulate how you got here. They articulate that God is the creator of humanity and your mother and your father are the creator of your existence on this planet. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. Aren't you glad tonight Amen. that these two laws are the two positive commands and if you're honoring your father tonight, I'm so glad. I invite you to start remembering the Sabbath so that now you can honor God, your creator. Amen, somebody? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Then the sixth commandment says, you shall not murder. This law protects your relationship with your neighbors, with your brothers and your sisters, your fellow men. This law makes it safe for you to be around. If you keep this law, you can come by my house anytime and I can sleep in peace because I know I'll wake up in the morning and I won't find myself dead, hallelujah. Then this law says you shall not commit adultery. This law protects my wife from you. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Aren't you glad 
There's a law that actually protects my wife. There she is. She's looking mighty fine, isn't she, with my two children. And I'm so glad there's a law that protects my wife from some of y'all brothers. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen, 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 amen. <laughs> I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord for that truth tonight. And then I'm so glad that we've got another law here that says thou shalt not steal. Don't steal. This law protects your stuff from me while I'm here in Africa. Amen, somebody. You ain't got to worry that I'm going to come by your house in the middle of the night and take your stuff. I stay at Brother Becky's house and his stuff is safe. Amen, somebody. I ain't got space to take it back in here. But <laughs> it's safe because I live my life according to this law that says don't steal. And then this law here, the ninth, the ninth law says you shall not bear false you shall not bear false witness. Don't lie against your neighbor. This law protects my truth from you. And then the final one says, you shall not covet your neighbor's stuff. His house, his wife, or his manservant, maidservant. This law protects your stuff from me in my mind. So not only is your stuff safe physically from me, but your stuff is safe in my mind. I am not walking around carrying the thought in my head that I want your stuff. And you're not walking around carrying the thought in your mind that you want my stuff. Some of you looking at my suit, I like that suit. That suit fits him mighty fine. I wish I could have that suit. Well, you can wish all you want, but there's a law that says don't covet my suit. Amen, somebody. Hallelujah, somebody. Somebody looked at my laptop the other day and they said, man, that's a nice laptop. And they looked at my iPad and they said, man, I like that configuration. In fact, it was Pastor Mafafi. He was looking at my laptop and looking at my iPad and I know he was looking at it and saying, I wish I could have that configuration. I like how you can control your laptop with your iPad. I, I want that. But I rest assured, I let him carry my bag because I know way down deep in my heart that he is not coveting, cherishing, desiring to have my laptop or my iPad. This law can protect my stuff from him. So these laws keep us safe, keep us protected. Now you tell me which one of these laws is abolished? Which one do you want to be abolished? The first four help me to articulate my love for God. The last four, the last six, pardon me, help me articulate my love for my fellow man. Now, I just want to make it plain here this evening. Ooh, I'm moving. I got to move, move quickly here this evening. I want, to, I want to do a demonstration for you tonight. But uh, before I do, let me just say a few words. I'm running out of time, but I think I got up a bit late and we had some technical difficulties. You'll bear with me, would you? All right. Now, let me just make this plain here. The in tablets of God upon which the Ten Commandment law was written were inscribed by the very finger of God. God wrote these laws down with his own finger. Even though this is the very first time God had given his law in written form, this law had existed from eternity past. The eternal, unchangeable standard of morality has been the basis of God's government from the beginning of time, from the beginning of eternity. In fact, even the angels were governed by God's commandments. The Bible says they were given the choice of either following God's law or ignoring it and rebelling against it altogether. Satan and his, and his angels chose to rebel. And this rebellion led to their expulsion from heaven. Look at what the Bible says right here. The Bible says, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was there a place found for them in heaven any longer. Look at what the text continues to say there. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil, and Satan, who deceived the whole world, he was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. But there were angels who chose to follow God and remain loyal to his law. 
Psalm 103 verse 20 says, Bless the Lord, ye angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments. Thanks be to God, the angels that chose to obey God. Adam and Eve, however, had a knowledge of God's law in the Garden of Eden, for they felt the emotions of shame and guilt and despair after they sinned. So they had a knowledge of God's law after Cain became angry because God accepted Abel's offering and not his offering. The Lord asked, why are you angry, Brother Cain, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, will you, well, then, you know, sin lies at the door. God's law had to be in effect at that time for uh, them to be able to experience this conversation of do well and don't do well. Romans chapter 4, verse 15 says, where there is no law, there is no transgression. What the devil has tried to do is do away with transgression, do away with the concept of sin, make it so that there is no sin, because if you do away with the law, then there is no sin. Webster's New World College Dictionary says, transgression, breach of a law, duty, is sin. That's what transgression is. Abraham knew and obeyed the law of God long before the law was spoken at Mount Sinai. Look at what Genesis 26 says. God said he would bless Abraham, his descendants, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. I just stopped by to tell somebody here tonight, if you want to live the very best life, you want to start looking to see in what way have I broken God's law? In what way have I denied the existence of God's law? In what way have I forgotten God's law? See, the law that says don't steal doesn't just mean don't steal. It means, hey, there's stuff you are called by God to give to your neighbor, but you're not giving it. So you're stealing the gift that God has deposited in you. You're stealing it from your neighbor because you're stingy and you refuse to give. You didn't think of it that way, did you? The law that says don't kill is also saying, hey, there's in some way that you're supposed to give life to others. You're supposed to engender life in others. You're supposed to support the life of others, but you kill them when you withhold your blessing, when you withhold your sustenance, your nurturing, your giving, your loving from them that will give them life. The law that says don't lie means that in some way, shape, or form, you've got to foster the truth of others. You've got to support their truth. You've got to uplift their truth. And sometimes by being silent, you're not telling a lie openly, but you're being silent when if you only open your mouth, you would establish their truth and exonerate them. I invite you tonight, if you want to live a powerful life, if you want to live a victorious life, if you want to live a life of destiny, if you want to live a life of accomplishment, if you want to be highly respected and honored in society, don't say, I have kept God's law. No, start looking for, in what way have I broken God's law? In what way have I, I didn't sleep with no woman that's not my wife, but I was lusting. No woman's safe around me because I can't keep my eyes straight. I can't look her in the eye because I'm looking at all her other body parts and she's not safe around me. If you want to live a life of power, of respect in society, of nobility, of honor, of greatness, of grandeur, you've got to say, hey, I'm going to not only keep God's law, but I'm going to love God's law. Because by loving God's law, I get to love God and I get to love God's people. Amen, somebody. I like what the text says here, skip, skip, skip. I got to skip a little here. Pray with me. I got to move on. I got to skip a little. I want you to understand the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws so the people rested on the seventh day? See, there is an articulation from scripture where God establishes his law. God pronounces his law. God speaks his law. But in our world today, we have many people who think they know better than God. They think they want to do away with God's law. They say God's law is abolished. God's law has been eliminated. But I stop by to tell somebody that God's law is the eternal standard of right for the universe. And really, should it surprise us that God has a law governing his kingdom? There's no harmonious society that's happy and safe as a community that can function without the rule of law. Even children cannot play any games that they play without rules. Is it any surprise that God's government should also have rules to follow? 
First Corinthians chapter 14, 33 declares the apostle Paul wrote for God is not the author of confusion. The New Testament makes it plain. It does not do away with the law of God. Instead, it helps us better understand the reason for its existence and how we can obey God's commandments. Look at John 14, 15. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. In fact, Jesus is quoting from the Old Testament, pointing out that the love is the basis for keeping all the commandments. Now, I know that you're going to say to me, Pastor, the word for commandments here is entole in the Greek. It's not referring to the commandments, which the word for commandments in the Greek language is nomos. Well, you all Greek scholars who think I didn't know that, I just want you to know I did my research. And entole means the teachings of Jesus. But that does not exempt you because the teachings of Jesus elevate the Ten Commandment law. Hallelujah, somebody. He said, except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. They thought by keeping the law, the letter of the law, they were pleasing God. No, 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 no. He said, you got to keep the law in your heart. You got to keep the law in thought, in word, in deed, and in motive and action. The teachings of Jesus elevate God's law. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first commandment. This becomes your primary purpose and goal for living. Some folks tell me I'm bored in life. I have no sense of destiny. I have no future. I have no clarity of what's called, what God's called me to. I stop by and tell you tonight that if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, God will give you a destiny. He'll give you a sense of purpose. He'll give you a sense of responsibility and what he wants you to do in the world. The second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus says, if we truly love God with all our hearts, minds, and souls, this becomes your second greatest purpose in life. You can choose right now, right here tonight, to live a life where you love God with all your strength and you love your fellow man with all your strength. This motivates you. Just look at how it would look if you chose to love your fellow man your brothers and your sisters with all your heart, mind, and strength. You will choose to bring the very best of you to them. You'll choose to bring the very best of your ability, the best of your strength. If you become a businessman, you'll say, hey, I'm going to listen to their pain, their suffering, their problem that they have that they don't want, followed by the, I'm going to find a solution that they, they, they want that they don't have. You're going to look for some way to bless them. And your service, the product that you sell, becomes an expression, a manifestation of your love for them. You transform society. When you choose to love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. We will certainly express that love by first keeping the first com four commandments. God will be number one in our lives. Our worship will be reserved for him alone. This intention transforms your destiny by changing your orientation. You no longer orientate downward. You're now oriented upward towards God. Your entire life is dedicated, committed to serving the God of heaven. And we will respect and reverence his holy name. We will be eager to keep our appointed time with him. We'll reserve time in our busy schedule to meet with God at the time God says, hey, I'm available to meet with you in a special way. God's available and wants to meet with you every day, but there's a special time that he's set aside for him and you for God and you to dwell and commune and connect together. And God wants you to, to reverence that time. If we really love our fellow man as we love ourselves, we will surely respect and honor our parents and value life. We'll preserve morality. Respecting the property of others we will be honest in our relationship with each other. We won't covet what belongs to others. These are amazing principles that we get to live by. This Ten Commandment law, it allows us to estimate and uh, create the kind of life that we want to live so that we can know through our visionary perspective what's possible, what's available for us, and we can strive towards that life. The estimates indicate that to control behavior, mankind has drafted more than 35 million laws in all the world, but in the Ten Commandments, God gave 10 principles that truly govern and cover all human behavior. Only God could write such a perfect law. The Bible says that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. 
Perhaps the reason the law is perfect is because it is a reflection of the very person of God who is perfect himself. A Bible scholar named August Strong wrote, law is only the transcript of God's nature. Today, we would say the Ten Commandments are a profile of God's character, a character that is unchangeable, undeniable, and irrefutable. Being a perfect law, it can never be altered. Just like God doesn't change, but is the same eternally. So the principles of his government remain the same in all time and in all place. That that is the truth Jesus spoke of when he said it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one little tiny part of the law to fail but you say I've always felt that the Ten Commandments restricted my happiness sort of fenced me in caged me out and uh, limited me God never intended for his law to be a burden to man to restrict our happiness. On the contrary, God intended it would be a wall of protection, shielding us from sorrow, guilt, and boredom. Thank God I heard of one or two amens there. The Lord said in Deuteronomy chapter 5, 29, Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Just as we build guardrails on bridges and mountain roads to protect us from the danger of falling off the cliff, God gave us law and pro to protect and to guard our lives as we travel down the road of life. But you know, there is another reason God gave us his law, and that's simply this, by the law is the knowledge of sin. As St. Paul wrote, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. A story is told about a princess who led, she'd been led to believe by her subjects that her beauty was unsurpassed. However, one day a trader came to her village and sold her a mirror. And when she looked into the mirror, she was horrified. Why? Her appearance had spots on her face. And immediately she smashed the mirror to pieces. God's law is like that mirror. And as we look into it, like this princess, we may not be pleased with what we see, but destroying the law or ignoring the law won't change our condition. Oh no, it won't. God's law points out our sin and helps us feel the need of a savior. For while it shows us the problem, the law cannot give us power to overcome sin or remove the guilt. No amount of good we can do in the future will ever erase sin from our lives. It won't do away with the sins we've committed in the past. It won't annihilate them. It won't grant us forgiveness from them. No good you do tomorrow will give you forgiveness for the sin you did yesterday. How then can we receive forgiveness from sin? How can we be saved from the penalty of breaking the law, which is death? At the very gates of the Garden of Eden, God instituted a graphic reminder that disobeying heaven's eternal principles brings death. An innocent lamb was to be offered to show the faith of the sinner in God's plan to save fallen man. This was God's way of helping man understand how the innocent son of God must die to satisfy the claims of a broken law. Christ the Lamb of God would take men's punishment and suffer his death in himself on the cross. It was the only way for man to be restored. The law, broken law, certainly could not save him. The Apostle Paul said it, if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have come by the law. If the law could save us, Christ would not have had to die. If the principles of the law weren't very important, they could have just been changed and man's sin excused but they are the very principles of the character of God. God in his love and mercy found a way to save man that was in perfect harmony with heaven's principles.
But Jesus' sacrifice does not do away with the law. I want to do a quick demonstration right now to help us understand the value and efficacy and eternity of God's law. So I need, I need eight people to help me with this demonstration. I need eight people. Uh, I need eight people. First, I need somebody, somebody up here. Uh, let me see, who can I find? I need eight people. I need a big man. Give me a big man, somebody. I need somebody who will play a big man. Who's a big, tall man? Uh-huh, I need a big, tall man. I need to, come on, come on, y'all stand quickly. Are you sure you're big enough? You're a big man? Are you a big man? All right, come on up. He's a big man, okay? We're gonna bring this man up here. He's gonna be the church. Somebody help him get those demonstration uh, placards over there. Uh, I need two men to be the church. Come on, Becky, can you help me with those, please? Uh, I need two men. Y'all gotta move quickly. I ain't got much time. You gotta move quickly. Come on, I need two men to be the church. All right, come on over here, over on this side over here, and bring that church with you. All right, I need somebody else. I need a big man now to be the preacher. Who's the preacher? I need a big man, a big man to be the preacher. Are you the preacher? You the preacher? Have you ever preached before? You have? You sure? All right, come on up, come on. All the way over here, church, church. All right, how y'all feeling, church? You look like church indeed. How are they looking? They look like church? That's the church over here. Everybody say church. Ah, uh, you sound mighty weak. Say church. Church, that's the church, all right? Now you're the preacher, but preacher, you gotta have your sign. Go over there, get the preacher sign. Okay, I need two people to hold that preacher sign because it's a big sign. Becky, I need you to help them over there get the signs quickly, please, my brother. Come on now. I need the preacher. I need two people to play the role of preacher. Come on, folks. I need two people to play the role of gospel. Gospel. All right, two people to play the role of gospel. Come on, quickly, quick, 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 quick. You gotta move, folks. God, let's go. Preacher, come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. Come on up, preacher. You guys moving too slow. Preachers got to move. Come on, quick. Move. You got to move over, guys. Move all the way over. All the way. All the way. All the way. Hold it up, guys. Come on. Gospel. Come on. Hold it up. Come on. Come on. Come on. Actually, y'all should probably be down front, but that's fine. Come on. Gospel. Okay, now I need Savior. I need Savior Jesus. Come on up. Come on up, Savior Jesus. Y'all got to move. Savior Jesus. Now I need somebody to be cross. I think one person could be the cross, right? One person could be the cross. Who's the cross? Let's get the cross up here. Get the cross up here. All right, cross, come on up, cross. I need somebody else to be grace. Okay, and I need two more people. One to be sin and one to be law. Now, y'all all men up here. I need a couple of women. I need a couple of women. Let's get a woman on grace. Let's get a woman on grace. Brother, give that to the, a woman up here. I need a woman. Come on, I need one woman in the house. Come on, get a woman on the grace. Let's get a woman on the grace. Brother, your grace. Could you give that to the woman and you take sin? Now, we got sin over there. Grace, you help this man with the cross. You help this man with the cross over here. You help this man with the cross. All right, all right. And you got to hold that law up, brother. Hold the law up. All right, how are we looking? Okay, everybody ready? We go to church. Now, when I say the, when I say, when I point to it, when I point to the sign, I want you all to say it. Everybody ready? We go to, all right, let's try it again. We go to, to hear the, Preach the about a Jesus who died on the trip. Yeah, you backwards. You got to come over here, sister. You in the back, wrong way. Yeah, move. You, 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 you over there. Forgive them. They know not what they do. All right. Let's try it again. Let's try it from the top. Now, everybody ready? We go to to hear the preach the. About a, who is, who died on the, to bring us, which is pardoned from, which is breaking God's, you didn't say law very loud, which is breaking God's, all right, all right, see, isn't that what we do? Do we do anything else? No, we don't do anything else. We go to church to hear the preacher preach the gospel about a savior who is Jesus, who died on the cross to bring us grace, which is pardoned from sin, which is breaking God's law. Now somebody somewhere lied and told you that the law of God is done away with. I don't know how they said it. They say it's done away with, it's abolished, it's nailed to the cross, it's no more, that there is no law, that all we have is love. So Mr. Law, I think you're looking pretty good tonight. How you feeling? 
You feel good? You feel righteous? Do you feel holy? All right, I don't care how you feel. They said there is no law. So I got to say goodbye. Thank you. You've served us well. There's no more law. All right. Let's start again. Everybody ready? All right, we go to? To hear the? Preach the? About a? Who is? Who died on the? To bring us? Which is pardoned from? Which is? If there is no law, sin is transgression of the law, but there is no law. So if there is no law, then there is no sin. Sin. We've been wanting to get rid of sin for the longest while. And so we got to say goodbye. There's no more any sin. Go on. All right, everybody ready? All right, let's start again. We go to? To hear the? Preach the? Which is about a Savior who is? Who died on the? To bring us? Which is? Pardon from? But there is no sin. What you need grace for? If you don't have sin because there is no law, you don't need no grace. Do you agree? All right, there's no grace, goodbye. Y'all ladies, beautiful, you're kind and wonderful. I love grace, but we don't need you tonight. All right, everybody ready? All right, let's go, let's go, let's go. We go to? To hear the? Preach the? About a? Who is? Who died on the? To bring us what? What he died for? To give us grace, but there is no grace because there is no sin, because there is no law. So his death on the cross was just, I don't know. So there is no need for the cross any longer. So Mr. Cross, Mr. both of you cross, you can go home. Thank you so much. All right, everybody ready? Let's go. You go to? To hear the? Preach the? About a? Who is? Who did what? Did nothing. Exactly. So, Mr. Jesus, go on home. Everybody ready? You go to? To hear the? Preach the? About a? Who, who is the Savior? There is no Savior. All right, go on home, Mr. Savior. All right, everybody ready? You go to? To hear the? Preach the? Which is what? A bunch of noise. Right? And that's what you hear in some churches these days. Just a whole lot of noise. Talking about singing and shouting and praying and dancing. And you're saved and you're delivered. It's just a whole lot of noise because there is no gospel conversation. So gospel, you can go on home. And so you go to? Church. To hear the? Preach. preach what? Nothing. Which is what you hear in many churches. Go to the church and you come home, oh, Reverend sure did preach today. What did he say? I don't know, but he sure enough did preach. Hear that in a lot of churches. They say up there, in, especially in America, hooping and hollering and carrying on. And so because there is no law and that there, there is no sin and then there is no grace, there is no cross, there is no Jesus, there is no Savior, the preacher, there's no gospel, the preacher ain't got nothing to do, so preacher, you may as well go on home. And so you go to... To hear what? That's what happens. You may as well close down the church and go on home. Let's give our participants a hand. So we see clearly tonight, very clearly that there's no law, there's no sin because sin is the transgression of the law. If there's no sin, there's, there's no grace. Sin, since grace is God's loving mercy when we broke the law, and if there's no grace, then there's no cross. We can do away with the cross. And if there's no cross, there's no savior. We certainly don't need a savior. If you do away with any law, with the law, you also do away with sin and the need for grace, the cross and the savior. But God could not ignore guilty man's sins. He could not change his law. And that's why Jesus had to die. I'm so glad he died. And I'm so glad the text, the scripture says, for by grace 
you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Brothers and sisters tonight, if we are saved by grace, we're not free to live as we please, no, not at all. We're now empowered to keep God's law. Amen, somebody. I want to close tonight by reminding you that there are two systems. There are two systems. There are just two systems in the earth and the planet at this time. There's God's system and there's Satan's system. And God's system, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, makes it plain, is all about love for God and others. And Satan's system is all about love for self. That's why he wants to do away with God's law. But Bulawayo, Bulawayo, Jesus loves you. Do you love him tonight? If you love him, then you'll keep his law. The first four laws express your love for God. The last six laws express your love for the people God loves. Bulawayo, do you love Jesus tonight? Bulawayo, if you love him, you'll keep his commandments tonight. Bulawayo, if you love him, you'll honor him and worship him tonight. Bulawayo, if you love him, you'll obey him tonight. Bulawayo, if you love him, your life will never be the same tonight. Bulawayo, if you love him, you'll rise to a new standard of living tonight. Bulawayo, if you love him, you'll live your life with destiny and power and, and overcome his victory tonight by keeping God's law. Somebody here today has seen God's law in a brand new way. And you want to make a decision right here, right now. And I want to give you that opportunity tonight. And I know for all of you, you've heard this message tonight. And your hearts have been thrilled and stirred. And I believe all of you tonight are saying, hey, Lord, I want to live my life according to your divine law. And I want to invite you right here, right now, wherever you are, to just stand. If that's your declaration, if that's your will, if that's your desire tonight, right now, wherever you are, I invite all of you who desire to keep God's law, to live your life according to God's word, God's will, and God's way as expressed in God's holy law. I invite you, let's stand together. I invite you to stand with me. I want us to sing that song, All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love, trust in his presence daily. Live. Keep singing, keep singing. Somebody here tonight is saying, Pastor, for the first time, I've seen the truth about God's law. For the first time, I understand the importance and the value of God's law. And I want to surrender my life I want to surrender my all. I want to give my all to God and manifest and express my commitment by keeping God's law. I want to just invite you, raise your hand wherever you are all over the building right now. If you want to keep God's law, if you're dedicating yourself to keep God's law, to be obedient to God's law, to express the fact that you submit to God's authority in the world and in your life, 
by keeping all of God's Ten Commandments, I invite you right now, won't you just raise your hand right now, wherever you are. Somebody has that desire right here, right now. Wherever you are, you want to say, Lord, I want to keep your law. I want to commit myself to obey your law. I want to express love to my loving Lord and I want to express love to my fellow man by keeping God's law. I'm not seeing too many hands raised up. I'm wondering what's up, what's going on here? Are you resistant to God's law? Do you not love God's law? Somebody wants to commit themselves to keeping God's law tonight. Somebody wants to say, I want to keep God's law. I want to obey God's law. Put your hand way up high if you want to live your life according to God's law. Oh yes, now I'm seeing some hands. Praise God. I want to live a bigger life by keeping God's law. I want to live a life where my neighbors are safe from me. They don't have to be afraid that I'll destroy them. They don't have to be afraid that I'll take their stuff. Somebody here tonight is saying, Lord, I thank you that your law is an expression of the kind of life I get to live when I have you as the center of my life. Wherever you are, I invite you right now, if that's your desire, put your hand up way up high. Way up high if that's your desire. All right, now if your hands are up, I thank you. I invite you to just come forward. All of you got your hands up, just slip out of your seat and come forward. If you've got someone with the hand up next to you, just grab them by the hand and bring them forward. I want to pray with them right now. Come on, come on, you can come. Just come on forward to the front. Don't be afraid, don't be shy, just come on down. I want to pray with you right now, right now that you can commit yourselves fully and completely. Now you've got that decision card in your hand. The ushers have given you a decision card. I want you to just take a moment. Come on out. Come on down. There's still people coming from the back. There's folks coming. Come on down. Come. You can come. Come on down. Keep coming. There's space at the front. There's space in the front. If you want to commit your life to keeping all of God's commandments tonight, I've shown you plainly from Scripture that all of God's commandments express your love for God and your love for your fellow man. So come on down if you have that commitment tonight to keep God's law. I want to pray with you right now. I want to take that card, that decision card, just write your name on it and tick off what you want. If you want prayer, if you want baptism, if you want Bible study, if you want a visit, whatever you want. If you have a question, just fill that card out right now as the ushers pass it by. And I want to get that information from you so that I can connect with you later on this week. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which shines with a luminescent glory in this dark and dismal world. I thank you, O oh God, that you've expressed your law in the world, which is a transcript of your character, your character of love and truth. Lord, we know that we live in a world where the enemy has sought to usurp your law by declaring that your law has been abolished. But tonight, oh God, we've seen that we, if we abolish the law, eradicate the law, end the law, we do away with the whole plan of salvation. We end the church as we know it. And so God, I thank you tonight that you've established your law in Jesus Christ. He said, I've come not to destroy the law and the prophets, but that it should be fulfilled. Lord, somebody said it's fulfilled. That means we don't have to keep it no longer. I thank you, Lord, that we don't keep it to get salvation. Jesus kept it. And by his keeping of the law, we now have salvation. But the law is still a standard of righteous living in the world. And through the indwelling power of your Holy Spirit, young men and women here today have pledged and committed to keep your holy law tonight. Lord, I pray that you'll seal their decision so that through the indwelling power of your spirit, you can day by day move them closer to the heart of God where you align their day by day behavior, their thoughts, their attitude, their motive, their actions, their, their experience so that it's more like God in alignment with God's truth and God's love, love for God and love for their fellow man. 
Thank you, God, that by doing this, you make us more like you. You make us safe to save so that we can be the redeemed. Bless us tonight, oh God. Fill us with every good gift from above. Give us your, your goodness, your glory, your greatness, and your grandeur. May it shine within our hearts. May it transform our lives. In Jesus' precious name I pray and for his sake. Amen. Let's sing that song together. We, we know not the hour. Our theme song. Let's start it. Who can start it for me? Right. We know not the hour of the master's appearing. Sing right there. Start, start, start. 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 